We're continuing on in our series of Mark's Gospel uh, by learning some things. And what we're going to learn is we're going to learn some mysteries of God's kingdom. All right, God's kingdom, that's the subject. And just some mysterious things about it that, that the original audience didn't know when they first heard Jesus talk about it. And probably some things we don't know as well. But before we look into it, let's start with two big questions to guide us a little bit. First question is this, what is God's kingdom? Like, what is God's kingdom? And then the other question is, why should I care? Right? Like, what is God's kingdom and why should I care? Uh, the what is God's kingdom, we're going to tease out a little bit today as we walk through it, but we've got all of the rest of Mark's gospel to do that as well. So we'll be getting into that more as we go further in Mark. Um, that why should I care thing is what I really want to address right up front. Uh, and here's why. We really should think about it and care about it because so many of the Old Testament prophecies were about the coming of God's kingdom on earth. Did you know that? That's pro- predominantly what the prophecies in the Old Testament were about, was the coming of God's kingdom on earth. And about one, uh, the Messiah, who was going to establish God's kingdom on earth. So most of the Old Testament prophecies were about the Messiah who was going to come and establish God's kingdom on earth. That's why we should care about it. We should also care about it because Jesus declared that in and through his life and ministry, the kingdom of God had arrived. That's a big statement, wouldn't you say? And by saying that, he was declaring that that the hundreds of Old Testament prophecies were ultimately about him. Right? Like, that's a big statement. He's saying that all those prophecies are ultimately about me and what I came to do. Remember the words of Christ at the very beginning of Mark's gospel. Really, the first thing we see Jesus saying. Uh, Look on the screen there. Chapter 1. It's been a long time since we've been there, but chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, look what Mark says. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. So here we get the first taste of Jesus preaching and teaching. What is he preaching and teaching about? What is he declaring as he goes out into the world? And, and, And what is he saying? Look what it says. The time has come. What time? Well, well, the time you've been looking forward to, the time that is declared is coming in the Old Testament that there's a Messiah coming and through that Messiah, the king is coming and he's establishing his kingdom. That time has come, Jesus said. Why? Because he's on the scene. Look what he says. The kingdom of God has come near. I'm here. The time has come. The kingdom of God is here. So therefore, what's the logical response? Repent and believe the good news. Turn from your sin. Turn from all the other kingdoms that you are wrapped up in and come be a part of my kingdom. And know this is good news that you've been longing to hear, right? So it's clear. Jesus launched his ministry by declaring that the long-awaited kingdom of God has now come into the world. There's no denying that that's what he was saying, right? So it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to back it up, right? So, so how does Mark in his gospel go about showing that that is exactly what was happening in the ministry of Jesus? Uh, just so you know, this is the overarching theme of Mark's gospel. He emphasizes the king, Christ as the king, and that he came to establish God's kingdom. That's the overarching big idea of Mark's gospel. So how does Mark lay out the life and ministry of Jesus to prove that? He does it primarily by showing how Jesus exercised the authority of God over all of creation. That's one way to think about when we do say, well, what is the kingdom of God? Obviously, uh, it's this idea that there's a king and he's got authority and he's got power and he rules over things, right? That's what it means to be a king, right? And so, so how does Mark show that in Jesus? Well, he shows it through Jesus doing all these things that only God could do. 
right? Uh, healing people, doing all kinds of incredible miracles, uh, teaching with an authority that all the people are like, man, we've never heard anybody teach with this kind of authority. And on top of that, he can even cast out demons, right? So he's teaching with authority, doing miracles, doing miracles, doing all kinds of incredible things. And on top of that, he can like tell demons to leave and they will, they flee from him. He overcomes the temptation of Satan, if you remember that. The moment he was baptized, goes off into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Why? To prove that he's even king over Satan. Because even Satan wasn't powerful enough to cause him to get off mission. Uh, And then also you have Jesus saying things like this. If you remember chapter 2, verse 27 to 28 talking about the Sabbath, right? Look what he says, the day of the Lord, right? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Look at this. So the son of man, uh, again, that's Jesus' favorite term for himself, title for himself. We heard it read in Daniel earlier. Uh, Chad read that. He's calling himself the son of man, by the way, saying I'm the fulfillment of that prophecy in Daniel. The son of man, look at this, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Whoa, what's he saying? If you're the Lord over the Lord's day, what are you saying? You're Lord, right? In other words, you're God. Your Lord means basically ruler or king, So in all these ways and in a lot of other ways that we're going to see as we go through Mark's gospel, Jesus is proving that God's kingdom has come on earth and he is the one bringing it into existence, right? And the evidence of that kingdom has come is all that spiritual power and authority that Jesus revealed over again, over and over again, over everything and everyone. And by the way, Regarding this kind of kingdom authority and power, uh, the guys that were at the men's breakfast yesterday morning got a little taste of this. But when we get to chapter six, we're also going to see that those who are followers of Jesus have also been delegated kingdom authority as well. The kingdom authority that Jesus had, he actually, actually now passes that on to his own followers, which if you actually really believe that and live in that, it's going to radically transform your life and the lives of those around you. Now, how is this possible? How is this kind of kingdom authority here? Here's why. Because Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God on earth in his first coming, and it's been growing and it's been spreading one person at a time for the last 2,000 years, and then the kingdom of God will be consummated or completed when Jesus returns in his second coming, okay? So he inaugurated the kingdom when he came 2,000 years ago, and when he returns, which none of us know when that, when that is, it hasn't happened yet, so it's obviously still in the future, he's going to complete the kingdom on earth. It will be visible and obvious and present all over the world. So theologians will often speak of kind of our current state of the kingdom of God using this term, that this is the already not yet kingdom. How many of you ever heard that before? Right? So what is the current state of the kingdom of God right now on earth? It is the already slash not yet (laughs) kingdom of God, meaning it's here because Jesus inaugurated it in his first coming. That's clear. That's what Jesus said he was doing. Unless you don't believe Jesus, we can talk about that. But that was clearly what he was saying. And then he was proving that he was, that was true through all that he was doing, all that he was teaching. But it's not fully and perfectly in play because it hasn't been completely consummated, right? We're all watching the news, right? We all see what's going on in the world. It's obvious that the kingdom of God is not completely fully established on earth yet. 
right? And again, that's going to happen when Jesus returns. And I just give you a couple of references. Revelation chapter 20 through 22. Those, those chapters are give you a beautiful image and picture of what's going to happen when Jesus returns. Now, let me try and illustrate this for you. I, I hope this is helpful. Some of you already know this because some, I know some history buffs in the room. Uh, but let's talk about World War II for just a second, okay? Um, believe it or not, I wasn't alive then, but I've heard, all right? So uh, August 14th, right? Is it August? Yes, August 14th, 1945. That is known as VJ Day. Why? Because that means victory over Japan Day. That was the day in history where World War II ended, it was over. Why? Because uh, Japan unconditionally surrendered to the Allied forces. That was the last little bit of World War II over the Pacific Theater. And on August 14th, 1945, Japan finally surrendered. So in one sense, there was victory. The war had been won. Uh, one, a, a group of powers, many nations came together and overcame another power in the world, right? So in biblical language, you could say, a number of kingdoms overtook one kingdom, right? But here's what's crazy about it. We, we, I'm sure we all know Japan is not just one island. It's a chain of many, 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 many islands, some pretty good size, some really, really small and isolated. And for months and months and months and months, even years, there were uh, Japanese mil uh, military forces all spread out through the islands. And so it took months and months and months for the allied forces to actually kind of exert that authority and that power, we could say kingdom, over all of Japan. Because I I'm sure you know in history, uh, the Japanese soldiers were like, that war the war is never going to be done. We will never surrender. We will fight to our own death, right? And so for months after the, in a sense, their kingdom had been overcome. They were acting as if it not. So that battle kept going. The war was won, but battles continued to rage. It was already, but not yet fully realized. And that's the current situation. That's the current reality of God's kingdom as well. Now, in regards to the passage for today, Mark 4, nobody would be faulted for asking, where is the kingdom of God today? Again, because you, you guys do watch the news, right? I stopped watching for a while because I was getting too depressed. So I, I quit watching for a little while. I got off social media, all that, for a little while. Because I was just like, man, I can't, this is driving me nuts. Is I'm too depressed. I need to be a happy guy and this is not helping, right? So I stopped watching for a little while. But we all watch the news. We all see what's going on. It's like, where is God's rule? Where is God's authority? Where is God's power in this, right? Where is God's rule in the midst of all this stuff? And part of the reason why we struggle with this is because of our understanding of the current state of the kingdom or, or maybe what our expectations are for what things should look like if God's kingdom is, is in place. And that was exactly the same issue for the religious leaders and the observant Jews of Jesus' day. Why were they, why was it so hard for them to see Jesus as the Messiah and so hard for them to understand that the kingdom of God was here and present in and through him? It's because what their mindset was. It's because of what they were looking for. They were looking for an earthly ruler. They were looking for somebody who was going to raise up an army and overthrow the Roman oppressors and conquer the world with military might. But that's not what Jesus came to do in his first coming. Now, believe me, that is coming. In his second coming, he does come as a conquering king and he does have an army coming with him and there's not even gonna be a fight. But that's not how he came in his first coming and that was the problem. They were looking for another kind of king and the king of the universe was right in front of them and they couldn't even see it. Look at this, go to uh, Luke's gospel. It's the next book right next to Mark. Go to Luke, go right to the right, chapter, Luke chapter 17. And notice how Jesus talks about this. 
He, he shows them the problem, that they're not even seeing it. Uh, Luke 17, verse 20 It says, once on being asked by the Pharisees. So again, the Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day. They were the ones who were kind of heightening the electricity in the air that the Messiah was soon to be here, right? They knew all the Old Testament prophecies. They were teaching that the Messiah was coming. And so they're they're on the lookout. And so they asked Jesus, hey, when is the kingdom of God gonna come? And then look at how Jesus replied. Here's your problem. I'm going to paraphrase it and then we'll read it. Your problem is you're looking for something that, that's not going to happen, right? You're looking for a different kind of king and a different kind of kingdom. Notice how he says it. The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. What's he saying? You're looking for an army and there's no army. You're looking for bloodshed. There is going to be bloodshed, but not how you think it's going to be. Uh, you're looking for a castle, right? You're looking for a, somebody on a throne. Uh, you're looking for someone dominating with authority and power over all the other powers of the world. That's what you're looking for. And Jesus says, it's not something that can be observed. That's not how Jesus' kingdom comes initially. Yes, that's how it's going to be consummated, but that's not how it came into the world. And that's not how it's operating now in the world. Okay, nor will people say, here it is, right? Like in, in America, we can go to Washington, D.C. and say, here it is. We can point at all the buildings. We can point at the, the Capitol building. We can point at all the important building where all the important people of our nation go to work and rule over and lead our country. Jesus is saying, that's how earthly kingdoms work that's not how my kingdom is working right now, right? You can't say here it is or there it is. Why? Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. What is he saying? The king is here, the Messiah you've been looking for, all those hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that you have memorized are all being fulfilled right here and right now in me, through me, and because you're looking for the wrong thing, you're missing me. I'm right here. And so Jesus wanted his disciples in these parables to know that the long-awaited Messiah and kingdom had come. They were under false assumptions as well. And so Jesus wanted them to know, no, uh, the king is here. The kingdom has come. And he, and he needed to show them that, that it's, it isn't coming the way they thought it would. Remember, he had one of his disciples, Simon the Zealot. We'll talk about zealots in, in just a minute. Right? So even among his disciples, they were looking for something else, right? They were looking for military battles. They were looking for bloodshed. Why? Because that's how kingdoms overcome in our world. There's bloodshed, there's fights, there's wars. We just talked about World War II. That's, that's how it comes in the physical fallen world. But in God's kingdom, no, no, that's not how it comes. Uh, it, it comes slowly, it comes progressively over a period of time, even in ways that couldn't be seen by human eye or understood by human intellect, okay? So what we're gonna see here in Mark 4 is that Jesus revealed three mysteries of the kingdom to help them see this is happening in and through him. And they were wrapped up in this story that God is writing in the world. Uh, uh, let me give you three things that he wanted to help them with, and then we'll get into those. First, to understand where we currently are in God's timeline. Jesus was like, I need you to know what's happening right now. The most important thing isn't what's going to happen in the future necessarily. Like, you need to know like, right where you are right now. So often, don't you see it in the ministry of Jesus? Everybody wants to know about the future, and he's like, hold on. We're gonna, the future's going to take care of itself. We're gonna, what about right here? What about right now? And that's exactly what Jesus is doing with his disciples. He's helping them understand where they are in God's timeline. He's showing them you're, you're in between Jesus' first coming 
coming and and his second coming. You're in that already not yet craziness that Jesus said, man, it's going to be messed up. It's going to be hard. It's going to be crazy. It's it's going to seem like God is losing. It's going to seem like you're wasting your time. And he wanted to let him know you're not and God is not. (laughs) Okay. Right. Another thing he wanted him to know. Uh, t- t- just to give all of us hope that God will complete what he started. The kingdom has come and it is coming and it will come. And rejoice in that. Rejoice. God finishes what he starts. And then the third thing, just to build our faith. Anybody need your faith built up today? Anybody need some encouragement today? That's been my prayer for today. It's honestly that, that we are encouraged. I needed to be encouraged this week, and I'm so thankful by God's sovereign plan. We just happen to be landing in this passage today. So if anyone's like, why is he talking about this? It's just the next verse. That's how we do it. We don't target or strat- It's just like next verse. We got to talk about it, right? So it's, it's here to build our faith, right? So we don't give in to fear. So we don't begin to doubt. We don't fall into the trap of believing that we're wasting our lives for living for God um, and living for his glory in the world, right? So that's why he gave these parables, all right? So now, let me give you those three mysteries that Jesus reveals about the kingdom that they weren't looking for, that they weren't aware of, and we probably, we weren't and aren't either, all right? So first one is this. Beautiful thing about the kingdom. God's kingdom grows by his power, not our effort, ingenuity, or skill. Man, let me tell you, that's really good news. God's kingdom succeeding in the world and God's will being done in the world is not ultimately dependent on us. Right? If God needed us, he's not much of a God. And this was the message that the crowds of Jesus' day desperately needed to hear. When Jesus arrived on the scene, as I said earlier, the air was electric with anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. They had been hearing for years and years that the Messiah was coming. They had already had many would-be Messiahs show up on the scene and all had failed in their attempts to overthrow Rome. So obviously these people are hearing another person who's claiming to be the Messiah and they're like, is he just another one that's going to fail? The people needed to be reoriented in how the kingdom of God was actually going to come. And you had different groups who needed to hear it different ways. As I said earlier, you had the zealots, right? And these were the ones who tried to force the kingdom of God by revolution. Just so you know, God's kingdom never comes through violence except for the violence at the cross. That's the only way God's kingdom comes in history through violence is the violence of the cross. And the reason Jesus had to to go through that violence was to absorb violence so that there's no longer a need for violence for God's kingdom to come. So, So the zealots, though, they were off. That's what they were looking for. Then you had the doomsday prophets. Our modern day, like, news media, right? Like, we've got our own doomsday prophets, Right? And, and th- those were the ones who were trying to predict the exact time and way in which the Messiah was going to come. And they were all wrong, as most of the time doomsday prophets are. And then you had the Pharisees again, the religious leaders, who they actually believed. You need to understand why they were so zealous about strict obedience to God's law and strict obedience to the traditions they had created because they actually believed that if, if, if Israel would finally and once in a, and for all obey all of God's law and all of these man-made traditions that in some way through their morality, they would usher in God's kingdom into the world. Like the world would all of a sudden become moral and righteous and then Jesus could enter into a kingdom that in a sense, human beings created. And Jesus is saying like, I don't need you for that. And that's not how the kingdom of God comes. And then you have Jesus showing up on the scene. The kingdom of God and saying like the kingdom of of God doesn't come through effort or strength or predictions. That's how earthly man-made kingdoms come. But that's not how God's kingdom comes. 
And he said that by telling a parable about all things a a seed. He says all that by talking about somebody throwing some seed on the ground. And that's what God's kingdom is like. So if you would look at verse 26, Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. Amazing, simple, but mind-blowing. Look at what he's saying. Mark 4, verse 26. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So it's pretty obvious what this parable is about. He's explaining what the kingdom of God is like. You don't have to be a theologian to see that, right? So this is what it's about. He said, a man scatters seed on the ground. So that's very similar to the very first parable we saw in chapter four, right? Talking about the farmer sowing seed. And in that parable, the seed was the gospel, how God uses the gospel and uses his word to bring life and transformation and kingdom growth. We can assume that Jesus means the same thing here. So the the seed is the gospel. So we're already getting implications of this. How does the kingdom of God come on earth through the power of the gospel and people believing the gospel and being transformed by it? That's why it's so, so important that we as a church never leave the preaching and teaching of the gospel because this is actually how the kingdom of God comes. And this is where so often Christians and churches get off track and then are like, oh, why aren't we seeing kingdom results? Because we're not using the thing that God God said the kingdom uh, would come from, which is the seed of the gospel in people's hearts, right? So seed is sown on the ground. And I got to love this because the farmers, the farmers in the room are going to be like, that's not how it works. Uh, And I live on a farm now and I'm like, those people work a lot. But here's what Jesus does. He totally takes human beings out of the picture saying it's obviously we know it's necessary. We have to do some stuff. God works through us and that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, if any kingdom growth happens, if anything of eternal significant happens, it's not because we made it happen. It's because God did it. All right. And that's what he illustrates. Keep going. Night and day, whether he (laughs) sleeps or gets up. How many of you farmers are like, hold on a second. Feels like all I do is get up and I don't get to sleep much, right? That's, again, he's saying it this way to drive home. He's using extremes to drive home a point. The farmers of Jesus' day would have been like, hold on, that's not how it works. We have to work really hard. And imagine how farmers back then without technology and all the things that we have today, how much they had to work and how hard it would have been. It's hard enough now. Imagine for them. So they got to be going, wait a minute. And every, this was an agricultural society and culture, of course. So everybody's like, no, no, no. We have to do a whole lot of stuff. And Jesus is like, that's true for man-made human kingdoms. Sure. But when it comes to my kingdom, I'm the one who causes the growth through the power of the gospel. Look at that. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Look at this. Though he does not know how. Isn't that awesome? And of course, in that day, they didn't understand all the scientific process of germination and all the stuff that takes place in the ground. They just knew the seed goes in, you do some stuff, and the the, the sprout, it pops up. They didn't understand all the science of that. But, but the reality is, you can understand all the science of that, but it still doesn't make it happen. That's the thing that God has done. That, that's the idea. So here, you don't even have to know and understand everything and have it perfectly figured out. And that's not going to hinder the kingdom of God. Isn't that awesome? Let that just bring relief over you. You don't have to understand everything about the Bible. You don't have to have God perfectly figured out. You don't have to be a theologian, right? You don't have to be able to get up and talk like this to people for God to do amazing things. Isn't that awesome? Because God's going to do the work. He's going to bring the growth. And by itself, look at this. Though he doesn't even understand how it works, it happens because God's doing it. Then 28, all by itself the soil produces grain. Now, this is a cool thing. This is where it does help knowing some of the original languages of the Bible. Originally in Greek, uh, where it says there in verse 28, all by itself, it's actually just one Greek word. We got three, there's one in Greek. And it's the word we get automatic from. Comes, uh, automatic comes from the Greek word. 
And so what is he saying? He's just saying automatically growth happens because that's how God does it. He takes the seed, you're sleeping, (laughs) you're relaxing, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're not understanding anything, and it doesn't matter. That's not going to hinder God, and that's not going to hinder his kingdom. He's going to automatically make it happen. It's a guarantee. How incredible is that? All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head, and then eventually it's enough to harvest there in verse 29. So please, if you are a Christian and you're understanding what Jesus is saying here, you should be feeling a massive weight lifting off of your shoulders right now. Spiritual transformation doesn't happen in the world because of your effort or skill or abilities. Of course, God works through us, but he doesn't need us. Spiritual transformation, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God happens by God's power, not ours. Man, here's why that's such good news, because if it was up to me, we're in huge trouble. If it's up to you, look at yourself. (laughs) Let's all just like look at ourselves for a minute. Imagine if the growth of the kingdom of God was dependent on us. What a joke. We should be, this is, man, to be serious about it, this is the only way I can go to bed at night and sleep. I need you to know that. Because if this was dependent on me, what God's going to do here at Crossroads or in Turlock or whatever, I would never be able to sleep because here's the reality. I know myself. I know my limitations. And if Adrian was here, she could go for hours on that. <laughs> she could tell you. Uh, pray for her. She's homesick today. But, but she, she could tell you, oh, no, we're in trouble. If it's up to him, woof, we got problems. We got problems. And that's true, but it's not. It's all done by God. So don't worry. God's got this. The world, listen, the world and your life is in very capable hands. It's not spinning out of control. The tomb is empty. (laughs) That's the good news. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And he is currently in heaven, seated on the throne, ruling and reigning over all things. His kingdom is continuing to spread. It is spreading right now. One person at a time. As people come to faith in Jesus Christ, God's kingdom rule spreads one heart at a time. And sometimes, Jesus is letting us know, the kingdom looks like a barren field. Like there is nothing going on. How many of you can relate to that in your life? It just looks like a barren, where is God in my own life? Where is God in our city? Where, look at what's going on in our country. Look what's going on around the world. I mean, there's wars all over the place. And it'd be really easy to look at that and go, Where is God? Where is his kingdom? Where is his power? Where is his authority? It'd be really nice if he'd show up right now. But here's what's amazing. What we see from scripture is all of that stuff, ultimately God's gonna take all of it to accomplish his good plan and his good will in the end. So actually nothing is out of his control. Even when it seems like nothing's happening, You go to sleep, you wake up, you look at the field, where's the growth? Go to sleep, wake up, where's the growth, right? It's happening. But under under the surface, where you can't see and don't understand what's going on, God's at work. And there's gonna be a harvest, why? Because God has guaranteed it. He's guaranteed it. And is doing everything by his own power to make sure that his will and his ways come to pass. Never forget this. In the end, God always gets what he wants. He always gets what he wants. How good to be God, right? 
We don't always get what we want, but at the end of the day, it's better for God to get what he wants. Because when God gets what he wants, we actually get what our soul's deepest longing wants, which is him. Relationship with him for eternity. And thank God God's going to get that. That's the good news. Um, Martin Luther, some of you may be familiar with that name. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King, one of our American uh, leaders uh, in the past. I'm talking about Martin Luther, kind of the original Martin Luther, the spark that God used to ignite the Reformation in Germany back in the 1500s. He understood this principle. Uh, it, 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 when he was asked about all the things that, that it seemed like he was involved in for the Reformation to happen, notice what he said about his work and his involvement in all that God did through the Reformation. Look what he said. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. So what, what's he saying? I just spread the seed. I just sowed the seed. That's what I did. Otherwise, I did nothing. What? Well, if, you, if you ever study Reformation history, you're going to say, no, he actually did a lot. But that's where he's saying, yeah, I do things. But at the end of the day, God's the one who brings the growth. God's the one who brings the transformation. I did nothing. And this is awesome. And while I slept or drank Witt Wittenberg beer, <laughs> he's German, he's German, right? And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, Philip and Amsdorf, the word, the word, the gospel so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. It did. I did nothing. Look what he's saying. What humility. This is insane. Like you need to hear more pastors say this. I did nothing. I did nothing. Look what he says. The word did everything. Exactly what Jesus was saying. And so James, Jesus' half-brother, steps in and encourages us. Notice what he says in James 5. Be patient then. Be patient. Don't fear. Don't doubt. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, just like that, be patient and stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. Near there means it can happen any moment. It's immediate. And that's the teaching of Jesus. He's like, hey, you, nobody's going to know when I'm returning. Only the Father knows that. So it's always this encouragement to be ready because you don't know when I could come back. And just know I am coming back, he's saying, and be ready. Let's look at another reality of God's kingdom. We'll do this more quickly. God's kingdom often seems small and insignificant, but in the end, it will overshadow all other kingdoms. It often seems small and insignificant, but in the end, will overshadow all other kingdoms. I just think, man, don't, how much do we need to hear that today? First, we all want to be part of something that matters. We all do. That's a human thing. We want to be a part, a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. So we give ourselves to causes and movements and political agendas, all because we were made to be wrapped up in something bigger and greater beyond ourselves. Second, it, it's so easy to be discouraged right now with all this happening in the world. And I'm really not even thinking of any thing that happened this week. It's not about, it's just like the culmination of tons of stuff all the time. It's so easy to be discouraged. More and more people are choosing to walk away from Christianity, meaning they're choosing to walk away from Christ. And yet that's not the end of the story. Because God is the God of not just huge, massive beginnings, He's also the God of small beginnings. There's this amazing passage in Zechariah that actually is a prophecy of the coming Christ where it, where it says, the prophet says, do not despise small beginnings. Think about the kingdom of God. What a small beginning. A baby born in a barn ushered in the kingdom of God. 
That's a small beginning that had massive, life-altering, eternity-altering conclusions. Notice uh, verse 30, Mark 4, verse 30. Uh, He's going to tell another parable. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? So again, this is about the kingdom of God. And what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Technically, the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed. For those of you who know these things, you're like, wait a minute. Uh, I'm on the internet and I know, right? You're right. But why is Jesus saying that? Again, he's like using this exaggerated language to prove a point. Is a mustard seed really small? Absolutely. And what he's trying to say is even from that dinky little tiny small seed, this massive thing can, can grow. All right, keep going. It's the mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. Well, how big can it get? Look, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. So this little teeny seed can produce this huge, massive thing that even birds can uh, put their nest in its branches. Uh, Here's something really beautiful here. It's subtle. But all through the, the gospel, the Old Testament, birds are used to symbolize Gentile people. And so often, as, as in the Old Testament, the prophets were saying, hey, just so you know, this kingdom of God thing, it's going to be bigger than one people and one nation and one little sliver of the world. It's going to the whole world. And, and even the Gentiles are going to be finding the shade through the expansion of the kingdom of God. It's not about a people, it's about peoples, plural, is what Jesus is saying. That's how big this is getting. From a virgin conceiving of the Holy Spirit and giving birth to God in the flesh in a barn to the whole world, all peoples, all nations, all ethnicities being transformed by the gospel and God's grace to enter into the kingdom of God in a newly created world forever. That's what Jesus is saying is gonna happen in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, don't be discouraged. The story is not over yet. The story that looks so small right now has a massive ending. The story that seems so discouraging right now has got an incredible, happy, joyful, beautiful ending for the people of God. All right, so I'm going to show my age a little bit here. All right, but just so you know, the best of the Star Wars trilogy was the original ones from the 70s and 80s. Right? You tracking with me? Those of you who don't know need to know. <laughs> Go watch them, all right? And, he, and here's the thing. Can you imagine if that original trilogy ended with The Empire Strikes Back? Oh, how awful would that be? It's dark. It's depressing. Han Solo is trapped in carbonite, <laughs> right? Luke is a mess, What are we going to do? The world's ending. Oh, no. There's a little glimmer of hope. And then you got Return of the Jedi. And you got the little fuzzy dudes dancing around at the end in a tree, singing dumb songs. I almost started dancing. By the way, I was at a wedding last night. I wasn't dancing, but there were some people in this room dancing last night. And come on now. I'm not going to point that person out right now, but she killed it. (laughs) But could you imagine, can you imagine if the story ended with the Empire Strikes Back, how depressing would that be, right? How depressing would it be if the story ended with Jesus dead in a tomb like every other false messiah that came before him? But that's not how the story ends. Do you know Paul, now we're just rolling, sorry. Do you know that Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians that the new creation began when that tomb emptied and Jesus came out. New creation has already begun. And when Jesus comes back, he's just gonna finish it. 
That's how much we can rely and rest and trust in the story. It's going global. It's going universal. Let me just give you a couple of references and you can read them on your own. Revelation chapter seven, verses nine through 10. That's where you see this image around the throne. And it says people from every tribe, every nation, every language, every tongue, worshiping God and the lamb. The birds get to nest in the plant, right? Uh, Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27. Again, this whole beautiful world recreated in kingdom of God on earth. Here's the end of the story. God wins. And so will everyone who chooses to place themselves in God's story by putting their faith and trust in Jesus. So here's a really important question for all of us. What story are you giving your life to? According to Jesus, there's only one that's going to last forever. The story of his kingdom. So don't put your life into the wrong story that's going to be overcome by his story. And that leads us to the last one. God's kingdom fully realized will mean blessing for some and judgment for others. Hey, just so you know, not everybody's going to be happy when Jesus comes back. It's not going to be a joyous time for everybody. It's not going to be a time of celebration for everybody. Look at verse 29, Mark 4. As soon as the grain is ripe, in other words, taking the parable, when it's time for Jesus to come back, he puts the sickle to it. Does that sound pleasant? He puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Just so you know, all through the scriptures, the imagery of a sickle is always used as a time of judgment. It's, this is not going to be pleasant and good for everybody. Verse 32. Here's, here's the good news. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. All those people who uh, originally were believed to be outside of the kingdom of God by God's grace in Christ are going to be brought in. They're going to be like birds, you know, perched in this bush, receiving the shade and the shelter of the kingdom of God. And those people are going to rejoice and it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be a celebration and it's going to be great. But that's not going to be the experience of everybody. Not everybody wants to be in the shade of the kingdom of God. Not everybody wants to be um, a follower of Jesus Christ. For some, God's kingdom's a place of rest and blessing. For others, when it's fully realized, it'll be the sign that they've run out of time. That God is no longer patient with them. And he's going to allow them to have what they've wanted their entire lives to live apart from his grace and his love in Christ. See, if you don't want to be a part of God's kingdom in this life, you won't be a part of his kingdom in the afterlife. That's the way it works. What makes you think if you don't want to be a part of his kingdom now that you would want to be a part of it then? And God's going to give you what you want. And you can see that. I'll give you another reference. Revelation 21, 1 through 8. It's really clear. There will be some who will be a part of his kingdom and some by their own choice in their own life will not be. So two things, two big ideas. There's a lot to take away, I hope, from this. But two big ideas. One, God's kingdom will prevail. Christians rejoice. Christians uh, don't fear. Don't live by fear. Don't believe all that you see and think that's the full story. Just so you know, if you want to, go back to the book of Revelation, read it from cover, the beginning to the end, and understand that why Jesus gave that letter to the church was he gave it to a very persecuted church, the early church, where it looked like the kingdom of God was not going to happen, that Jesus and his mission had failed because they were all getting killed and persecuted. And God gave this beautiful image, the book of Revelation, to say, okay, 
Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull the curtain back for you. So that's why you have uh, scenes on earth. And then you get the curtain pulled back and you see these other scenes, like scenes in heaven and all these things that aren't visible with the natural eye. And what God is saying is, listen, it looks like it's a failure. It looks like it's falling apart. It looks like you're wasting your time. But let me tell you the real story. Boom. Here it is. You have a king. He's overcome Satan. He's overcome sin. He's overcome death and yeah this life is hard right now because you're in the in-between but trust me the story doesn't end there it's not all the empire strikes back the return of the king is happening and he's gonna win and because of that you win if you're in christ be in christ christ